Bibles. If you have your Bible with you, I'm going to ask if you would to turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, a very familiar passage, even if you're unchurched, you don't go to church, you've heard this passage before. If you're an addict, you hear it every week because you, 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 you quote it. You've got it memorized. You say, I don't memorize scripture. You got this one memorized if you've been in addiction very long and in recovery. Because in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 15, the Bible says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy king- say it with me. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And then Jesus continues on, and he says, "And if you, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sin, your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. You ever, do you feel as close to God right now as you ever have? Do you feel as though you're growing in the Lord and His knowledge and His wisdom? Do you feel the love of God surrounding your life right now? You feel the peace of God? Do you sense the presence of God? How about the simple things? How's your prayer life? Are you in the Word of God, reading and meditating daily? How active are you in in the church? What about your witness? Are you leading people into a right relationship with God? And are you walking closer to God today? Can you honestly say that than you've ever been in your whole life? Problem is is that a lot of you may say yes, but the problem is a lot of you would say no, not really. Sort of dry in my spiritual life, a little bit dead, not the way I used to be. And I think one of the reasons for that, and one of the major offenders, according to recovery, the number one offender of addicts relapsing, and I believe completely stops spiritual growth and dries up your spiritual life is unforgiveness. It comes in many words. It can be called bitterness. It can be called resentment. But it all is rooted in unforgiveness. You see, unforgiveness is a spiritual disease that stunts spiritual growth. That's what it does. Now, in the passage that we read and in the prayer that you often say, it begins by just praising God, our Father, who's great, who's the creator, who's in heaven, who rules all the universe. Holy is your name. That's what hallowed means. It means holy is your name. You're different. You're set apart. You're not like us. You're not a sinner. You're a perfect, all-knowing, all-present God. And then he says, we rely on you. So please, we're not in control. We think we're in control. We want to be in control. But the fact is, we have to rely on you to even give us our daily bread. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have the health to work. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have the blessings that we have. So we rely on you to even give us our daily bread. And so at first it's simply a praise of God, but then it switches. And when it switches, Jesus kind of stays on a common theme because I believe this is the number one, as I said, offender to addicts. It's the number one offender to spiritual life. And that is forgive, help us to forgive or forgive our debts as we've forgiven our debtor. Forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, now think about that for a minute. I mean, really, do you really want to pray that? That you want to be forgiven exactly the same way you forgive? That's what Jesus says. He says, this should be your prayer. I want, to, I want you, God, to forgive me in the exact same way that I forgive others. And then he goes on to say, he says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver, d- deliver us from the evil one. Now that is sandwiched between forgiveness because the very next verse he says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But listen to what he says. But if you do not forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. In other words, you're not going to have a right relationship with God and be wrong with people. It's just not going to happen. 
Jesus makes it perfectly clear. I believe the greatest temptation here is the temptation not to forgive. Because what is the temptation not to forgive? What is it rooted in? It's rooted in pride. You hurt me. You owe me. I'm going to get you back. Is that not true? See, unforgiveness affects our relationships with God and reflect, ref, uh, affects our relationships with others. You see, not only does unforgiveness affect us spiritually, I believe it even affects us spir- uh, physically. A doctor once said that chronic anger puts you into a fight or flight mode, which results in numerous changes in your heart rate, blood pressure, and immune response. Those changes also increase the risk of depression, heart disease, and diabetes, among other conditions. Studies have shown that unforgiveness even affects our physical well-being. Unforgiveness also makes us a slave, makes us a slave to those who we believe have offended us. They may not even think about it anymore, but we spend sleepless nights over and over again wondering how we can get them back or what did we do wrong. You see, there comes a time in your life when you need to put the past in the past. Paul talks about that. Paul talks about there comes that time when I put my past in the past and I move on. But for many of us, we cannot put the past in the past until we've dealt with that past. And we need to deal with that past. And I often talk about this in recovery, and I often talk about it in addiction, and the fact that, yes, if you look at the 12 steps, there comes that time when you put the past in the past and you move on. But at first, the first five or six steps, man, you deal with root causes of addiction. Why did you do what you did? Why do you use? Why do you act the way you act? And many times as we deal with these things, we find that what happened is pain and offenses hurt us in childhood or even later on in life, and we have not really dealt with those sufficiently. Forgiveness is that process where healing actually begins. And we underestimate the power of forgiveness. You see, forgiveness begins with a decision, a simple decision. It's not based upon emotion. It's not based upon how you feel about the other person. Because trust me, your feelings can change at any moment. You know, they really can. I mean, somebody slaps you up against the jaw, then all of a sudden your feelings are going to change. Your feelings can change by just eating pizza. Feelings change. Feelings come and go. But a decision that's even beyond that feeling can begin to move you in an area, in a direction And redirect your life. The decision to forgive can be made today. Now, I'm not saying that immediately, miraculously, those that hurt you are automatically going to be withdrawn from your mind. But the process of forgiveness can begin today. Now, the first thing and the first step in the process of forgiveness, I believe, and according to psychologists, and I believe biblical, is that you have to acknowledge the pain. You have to, first of all, simply acknowledge it. You know, we many, many times minimize it. Well, you know, I don't care what they think. Oh, I don't think about them anymore. But yet it seems like every time that they're brought up, you can sense that bitterness coming from. Have you ever met somebody like that? When they're talking about an ex-husband or an ex-wife or an ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend, ex-friend? You know, they talk, oh, well, I, he don't bother me anymore. I don't ever think about it. And yet, but whenever his name's brought up or her name's brought up, you can sense the bitterness and the venom uh, flowing from that. I know I deal with that sometimes, you know. And it, it, I know of a lady, her, her husband cheated on her years ago, and uh, he actually left her for the woman he cheated on her with. And 50 years later, literally 50 years later, every single time I talk to her, she brings this guy up. She's always bringing him up, you know, about what he did and how he's a sorry guy, you know. And she said, but I'm over him. I don't, I, I, I've forgiven him. No, you haven't. If every single time that he's brought up this, you want to talk about it, you know, you want to talk about your feelings about him or you want to degrade him, then you really haven't gotten over it. See, sometimes it's hard for us to admit that we've been hurt because it intensifies the feelings. And so we'd rather just shove it down. We'd rather just repress it. We'd rather just not think about it. And you know what that's called? That's called numbing it out. Addicts know that term very well. 
We numb out. We use alcohol. We use drugs. We use sex. We use other things to numb out emotions and feelings because we don't want to deal with them. We don't want to think about them. And in order to begin the process of real forgiveness, you have to acknowledge the pain. You have to acknowledge what was done to you. You have to deal with it honestly and forthrightly. And you won't be able to work through that pain until you admit where it hurts. Now, when we do that, when we acknowledge that pain and we admit that we've been hurt by this person, now we need to sort of switch gears for just a moment. We need to put ourselves in the place of the offender. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been in need of forgiveness yourself? You have to remember that that person that hurt you, chances are they're a human being also. And chances are they're only giving to you what they have. I remember talking to a counselor many, many years ago, and I had some issues with my parents. None of you kids ever have issues with your mom and daddy, do you? But I had some issues with my parents, and I was uh, talking to this counselor about him. And he, you know, because I didn't think my parents met all my needs the way a good parent should, you know. And so I was telling them about it as a teen, uh, a teenager. I don't think that they did me right. I don't think they treated me right. I don't think that they uh, did the, the best, you know, because we have in our mind what a parent should be like. And, and it's always just parents got to be perfect. And it's only until we have kids of our own that we realize, whoo, man, we messed up too. But that counselor said something to me many, many years ago that stuck with me all these years. And he said, they only gave to you what they had. They gave to you the best that they had. Guess what? Your parents passed down to you probably what was passed down to them. And sometimes we have to put ourselves in the place of those that off offended us. You have to realize that they're human. They're messed up. Just like you and I are. And sometimes people just do something wrong. They just mess it up, you know? And so, and I, I find a lot of times when working in recovery and working with addicts, and I'm sure even working with church, that, that I will hear people talk about parents and the things that they did and how they were scarred growing up. And I do believe, I do believe that many of the issues that you deal with, even as 50 and 60 and 70 year old people can be traced back to root causes from your childhood. I do believe that. I do believe that. But what I find is we want to place the blame on them and yet we've continued the very cycle of neglect abuse and egocentrism that our parents passed down to us you know we've treated our kids the same way our parents treated us but yet we want to blame them for what they did sometimes when we as we begin this process of forgiveness and we acknowledge the pain, we also have to realize that the person that offended us, we have to put ourselves in their place to the best we can and realize that, guess what? They're messed up too, man. They really are. And, and, and also, we need to remember that God forgave us. That God forgave us. If you're a Christian, then you've admitted your need for God's forgiveness, remembering that God forgave you even when you didn't deserve it. And when you realize that, I'm not really sure that you can forgive others until you recognize your own need for forgiveness and that God forgave you. You know, the Bible says that God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ went to the cross and died for us. Do you get that? Do you really understand that passage? It says that while you were yet a sinner, it doesn't say that God saw the best thing you could do. God saw you working yesterday at the uh, Cory Walker Memorial Summer Block Party, and he saw you spend 12 hours here, and God looked down and went, well, you know what? That guy's good enough for me to go to the cross and die for. That's not what it's talking about. God's saying that while he saw you at your worst, and there's some secrets you got that you don't want anybody to ever find out. God was there. He saw it. You had never admitted, but God saw it. God knew exactly what you were doing, exactly what you were thinking, and at that moment, God loved you. Wow. God demonstrates his love for us while we were yet sinners. Christ died 
for us. You know, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, he doesn't say for God so loved those who would come to believe in him or that God would so love the Christian. It says for God so loved the world before people even came to the knowledge of him that he sent his own son to die in their place, to pay the price. We have to understand that God has forgiven us in spite of us. And we're not God. I understand that. We're not God. And maybe we cannot forgive like God forgives. But we're to strive to forgive like God forgives. And the reason we forgive is because we have been forgiven. I know that in my situation, when I was coming around and, and trying to walk with God and trying to find recovery, I know that, man, before that time, we were kind of talking about this last Thursday night, man, all I did was justify and rationalize every single thing I did. Man, if I got drunk, it was because of so-and-so did this to me and so-and-so did that to me. And if they had act right, I wouldn't do this. And, and some of you live with alcoholics and some of you are, have been alcoholics and you know exactly what I'm talking about because everything's your fault, right? Especially if you're living with one. You made me do it. Well, if I wasn't married to you, I wouldn't be drinking all the time. No, hey, you would too. You just drink before you met them, you know? It don't matter who you're married to. You done married three or four times. You're still drinking and drunk and acting a fool. So you know that's not true. But, oh, you want to place the blame. You want to justify. You want to rationalize. And somewhere along the way, I realized that, man, people had done me wrong. They had done me wrong, man. Try to keep my kids from me. Try to do the things that they did to me. They were just wrong as rain, man. And I felt like I was under an avalanche of what people, how people had wronged me and did me dirty. Then I realized that I'm the one who started the snow, I'm the one who threw the snowball that started the avalanche. You know, I could trace it all back to me. Somewhere along the way, I did it too. I was very much a part of it. I was an active participant in this avalanche that came down upon me. So in order to forgive, we sometimes have to look at our part of the situation. What did I do? Did I do something? You remember, God commands us to forgive. He doesn't just say, you know, if you, if you think about it, if you want to have a decent life, if you want to have some peace in your life, you probably need to forgive people. He doesn't say that. He says, as you forgive, that's how the Father's going to forgive you. You're not at requested to do it. He says you got to do it. In the same way you forgive others, that's how the Father's going to forgive you. In Matthew chapter 11, I'm mean, excuse me, Mark chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus puts it this way. And when you stand praying... If you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sin. In other words, before you even pray, you better make sure that you're working through the process of forgiveness. Whenever it comes to your mind, and it will come to your mind as you're working through this process, you simply say, God, you know I've forgiven them. You got to work through it. Pray. I know we got a young lady in our recovery group. We have this, uh, we have coin system there. And I don't, still don't know the, all the, what all the colors mean in those coin systems, but I know that the white coin means that you, you surrender chip. I know that means that you, uh, that you, uh, have decided to quit using drugs and alcohol. And so you surrender that day and you get a white chip. And then, of course, if you stumble and you come back, you get a white chip again. And then if you go three months uh, sober or a month sober, what, what color do you get? Come on. What color do you get if you're after a month? Red? All right, you get red. And if you go three months, you get blue. Now, listen. I buy the chips. And I probably bought, you know, like one thing of poker chips because that's what they are, just red, white, blue chips. But then we had this yellow chip. Now, the yellow chip is called a resentment chip. And if you pick up a resentment chip, the idea is, is that you pick this resentment chip up, this yellow chip, and then when you get over the resentment, you bring that chip back. I can't keep up with yellow chips. Yellow chips are gone. They go like hotcakes, man. Because the yellow chip, everybody seems to have a resentment, right? And the problem is they don't ever bring them back. They keep them. So I'm, I'm constantly buying these yellow chips out of resentment. 
But the advice that our, our recovery leader gives us all the time is that when you take that yellow chip, you need to pray for the person. Now, you don't pray for the person that you got a resentment to get that a bus to hit them. Ms. Tucker, you don't do that. That's, kind of, that's what you feel like praying. You know, that maybe something could lightning strikes when they walk somewhere. But what you do is you actually pray that good things happen to them, that they're blessed, that they come to find Jesus or whatever. Now, let me say this to you. When you do this, you're going to feel like the biggest hypocrite in the world. Because, you, because see, you live in America. And in America, actions follow feelings. It's true. If you feel something, then you do it. There's a lot of people not at church this morning. You know why? Because they didn't feel like coming. They didn't feel like it. So mostly, and we, many of us got married because of feelings. We felt it, and so we asked them out, and we, you know, and all feelings, actions follow feelings. But in the Bible, it teaches the exact opposite of that. It says feelings should follow actions. Now, we're not used to that, but it is a truism. I had a roommate, and many of you heard this story before. I had a roommate in college, and I couldn't stand that joker. The reason I couldn't stand that joker is because he was just like me. He was hard-headed. He was arrogant. He was egotistical. He always wanted his way. And, and him and I just clashed all the time. Two hard-headed. Now, I know you think it's hard to live with your wife, and you think it's hard to live with your husband, but imagine living in a room of four preachers. Well, that's what I lived with. And so I lived in a room of four preachers. It was me and three others. And so we, we, there was constant uh, a clashing uh, of egos and right theologies and doctrinal debates. And I got sick of it. I got sick of living with these guys. And this guy right here was the most arrogant guy I'd ever met and that, that I thought that I, I and finally, I just, I couldn't stand it anymore. I, was, I had to move out of that room. And, and I went to one of my other roommates, and I said, I hate Jackie. I hate him. I can't stand that guy. He's so arrogant. He's so, he's so rude. He just th thinks he's better than everybody else. And, and Steve, my other roommate, said, well, you know what you need to do? You need to pray for him. And I said that exact word. I said, you know what? I'll pray for him, all right? I'll pray for him. I'll pray he gets hit by the bus. I'll pray he gets struck by lightning. I'll pray for him. And he said, no, you can't do that. You got to pray that Jackie will be, have a bigger ministry than you. You got to pray that Jackie will be blessed by God. I said, Steve, there ain't no way I can pray that. He said, just try it. Just try it for a couple of weeks. So I went in my room and I actually tried it. I said, I'm going to try this thing. And I started going, God, just uh, uh, I thank you for Jackie. I thank you for bringing him in my life. It was all fake, man, I, whatever. God, I hope that Jackie is a success. I hope he finds him a good woman. I hope he has a great ministry, God. It was all fake, man. I didn't mean a word of it, you know. As far as my feelings of it, it didn't matter. But, you know, the more I prayed for Jackie, the more I began to mean it. All of a sudden, the feelings begin to follow the actions. And suddenly I begin to feel things for Jackie. I begin to all of a sudden see Jackie in a little different light, a little different perspective. But you know, one of the things that helped the most was that Jackie changed, man. God was answering. Jackie changed. He became sweeter to me. He became nicer to me. He became kinder to me. He actually asked me to go places with him. I was like, man, Jackie even... When I got married, he preached my wedding. Jackie changed in a great and mighty way, miraculously changed. You know why? Because I changed. As I prayed for him, my reactions toward him changed. Prayer for somebody else works. Now, I'm telling you, that, that is a spiritual secret that is true. Why do you think Jesus says, now listen to this, he says, pray for your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. If you will pray for these people, I promise you the feelings will follow the actions. Even if they're not around, even if you don't see them that often, you know, 
if it's possible with you, the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. We are called to do our best to reconcile relationships. Now, there are some people who's never going to forgive us. Let's, let's, just, let's just admit that. And there are some people that we're never going to restore those relationships with. But step eight of the 12 steps says this. It says, be willing to make amends. It doesn't say that you always will make amends. It says be willing to. In other words, you've got to be willing, as far as your part is concerned, to forgive. As far as your part is concerned, to reconcile that relationship. Now, the fact is, is that, that sometimes that relationship will not be reconciled because that person over there doesn't want it. And I can't make you love me. I can't make you be reconciled to me. All I can do is keep my side of the street clean. All I can do is do what I do, do my part to keep that relationship and to make that relationship right. And I can't, I, Chris is fly. He's messing with me. My brother's fly. Now, I do want to mention a couple other things before we close. Some of you in here, you got an enemy but the enemy you look at in the mirror every morning. See, some of you in this room need to forgive yourself. You've let yourself down so many times and you've failed so much. You know, one of the things that, that I find of people who actually come into recovery and begin to get set free is they have a really hard time forgiving themselves. They have a hard time um uh, with what they've done to other people and how they've hurt other people. I was one of those, by the way. I, I, I couldn't deal with the shame and the guilt when I started getting sober. And I didn't have the alcohol to numb that. Some people carry chips with them. Like I said, we do a chip system. I didn't carry a chip. I carried an eraser. I had a big eraser I stuck in my pocket. And I carried that eraser. And uh, During the day, I'd stick my hands in my pocket like I do even now. And I'd feel that big eraser. And it would remind me that God has erased my sin and put it as far as the east is from the west. And he put the past in a pass. You know? But some of us in this room today, we need to forgive ourselves. You know why? Because God loves you. And when we don't forgive ourselves, what we're trying to do is we're trying to punish ourselves. We think if, 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 I, if I don't forgive myself, then, then, I, can, then I can punish m myself for what I've done. Some of you don't understand exactly what I'm talking about because of the sex or the drugs or even having the baby out of wedlock and not being in a relationship and making some of the choices that we made. And, and, and you don't forgive yourself. You, and you even sometimes we even let our kids get away with way too much because of parental guilt. And I see that happen a lot with addicts. Our kids run wild because of what we've done and we feel like we owe the kid, you know, instead of really raising our kids the way children need to be raised. And I was talking to a lady the other night and I said, you can't do that. You can't do that because regardless of what you've done, your child needs a mother. Your child needs a father. It don't matter what you've done. You still need to tell them the truth. You still need to discipline them. But, and we, we, can't, we can't let parental guilt dictate what, how we treat our children. But a lot of us do. And I understand it. Don't get me wrong. I understand because I let my kid get away with murder too. I did. When they came to see me after the divorce, when they came to see me, man, whatever you want, I'll give you. You know, whatever you want, I I'll give you. Because I felt so guilty. And I never, and I didn't discipline them like I needed to discipline them as a real parent would and should. But some of us need to forgive ourselves. And we got to understand that forgiveness of ourselves understands that we've got to quit punishing yourself. You know why? Because when you punish yourself, you're saying what Jesus did is not enough. Jesus took your punishment. That's what the Bible says. Jesus took your punishment. Jesus went to the cross for your punishment. And he died in your place. And so if you're punishing yourself, you're saying that sacrifice is not nearly enough. I need some more punishment, Jesus. But Jesus says he takes your sin... And he puts it as far as the east is from the west. And he remembers it no more. You have to forgive yourself. You have to let it go. And once again, that's still the process. Remember the pain. Walk through it. Do what you can. Pray for yourself. <laughs> Pray that you can forgive yourself. And the last thing I want to mention is some of you in this room, I know this is, 
hard to hear. You're not going to believe it at first, but you need to think about it. Some of you need to forgive God. You think God cheated you. I can understand that. He's blamed for most of our situations, if we were honest. You know, after all, he could have stopped the pain. He could have saved the marriage. He could have not taken our mother. He could have not taken our father. He could have not taken our son. He could have not taken our daughters. Why did God do that? I understand that. But guess what? If I'm a finite man that understands that, don't you think God does? God understands that. God understands why you blame him. Even though we don't often understand that in this sin-filled world that everybody's going to die, that everybody's going to go through disease and tragedy and trial until we all get to heaven, until we all are healed eternally and spiritually forever. But God understands how you feel right now. Have you ever read the book of Psalms? Go through it. Read, whenever you're angry with God, read the book of Psalms and you'll find a choir that goes right along with you. God, why have you forsaken me? God, why have you abandoned me in front of my enemies? God, how could you do this to me? Over and over, the book of Psalms, the, the, the people are crying out to God, God, why? God, how? Now, how do we forgive God? Well, it starts with, once again, with honesty. God, how could you do this to me? And I'm going to say this as I close. Sometimes this process of forgiveness takes you taking a moment, in a quiet moment alone, and you sitting down and putting a pen and a paper in front of you, and you writing the name of the person or of God, and just writing there how you feel. Now, you may not believe this, but there's something cathartic and there's something miraculous and there's something magic about taking a pen and putting it to paper. It is. To see those words written out in front of you, the mention of what happened to you, even if after that you want to take it and burn it or throw it away or take it and pray over it, but take that piece of paper if you're really struggling with forgiveness and begin to write out what this person did to you. And I think as you begin to process this, this is the beginning of forgiveness. And let me tell you what's on the other side of forgiveness. On the other side of forgiveness is the life that Jesus has promised you. On the other side of forgiveness is peace and is joy. But as long as you live in resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness and anger, you're never going to have that, folks. You're never going to have the joy and peace that God has for you. And Jesus says, I came to give you life and to give it to you to the full. And it all begins, it all begins with forgiveness. Now, I know some of you are going to say, but you don't know what he did for me, to me. You don't have any idea what he did to me. You don't have any idea what they did to me. You don't have any idea what she did to me. Look, I'm just telling you what the book says. <laughs> I'm just telling you what the book says. The Bible says, as you forgive others, so shall you be forgiven. And wouldn't it be nice to be able to walk in the forgiveness of God, the peace of God? Well, it all starts with your own forgiveness of others. Would you stand with me?